Yeah, Sarah, thanks for joining me, friend. Yeah, glad to be here. So I've been really looking forward to this for a while. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we'll get <clears throat> time to dive into some of the things that we'll get to talk about. So thanks for joining me. Um, maybe just to start this life story question, would love to hear from you about your life and your background and anything that you feel like you'd like to share about your story. You can answer that in whatever way you'd like and whatever length you'd like. Yeah. I've been, I've been thinking more about like how to put this life story into context. And I think one of the threads that stands out the most to me is this sort of weaving the, I don't know, the analytical and intuitive, the like, you know, pragmatic and the mystical, the, the meta and the object level together. And sometimes that's looked like going back and forth and I'm really just keep seeking those like integration places for it and I mean it I started out in a kind of you know kind of like misanthropic environmentalism um very into like the activist side of things very into like things are really bad we have to like change it because it's really it's really messed up which you know there's a lot there's a lot there and I noticed people getting super burned out in activism and I was like okay wait a minute I can go into academia I can be on the policy side I can get ahead of these these terrible decisions and help inform them better so I went into grad school for ecology and conservation I uh and and I narrowly avoided becoming a world expert in shrimp that climb up waterfalls in Puerto Rico <laughs> as it turned out this was kind of way over on that that analytical side and there wasn't space for me as a full human in grad school it was pressuring me to become very narrow and I, and frankly my advisor was asking me for data that didn't exist I got really isolated and anxious and depressed and I was like okay I'm either going to try to switch my focus or or leave and um, I ended up leaving. I ended up uh, going to Peru to sort of ayahuasca shaman boot camp, um, which was very intense, fascinating. Uh, it wasn't actually called shaman boot camp, but th th that was, that was <laughs> <laughs> and, and a couple years later, they, they invited me back to, to work at the ayahuasca center. And this was just like, oh my God, I'm so deep in my sense of purpose. This is exactly where I need to be. I'm helping, you know, with the research center they're launching. I'm bringing together these threads of, of you know, mysticism and science is perfect. And ended up not being a good fit actually, because when I work with visionary mystical experiences, I need to keep my grounding in like metaphor in, and a kind of emptiness of, you know, if I'm talking, if I have a, if I have a beautiful vision of data from Star Trek, that can be meaningful, but it doesn't mean I'm literally talking to Brent Spiner or something. Um, so the, the, the guy who owned the center actually fired me. He's like, you are not, not a fit for this, too hmm. rational. Hmm. And then I kind of moved into more of, um, okay, well, if we're not going to be able to, if, if there's, you know, what's the leverage point here for, for changing the stuff that's, that feels out of alignment in, in society? You know, if the leverage point isn't necessarily more data on the science side of ecology, if it's not necessarily just on these, these mystical experiences that might, you know, change people, the way they relate to themselves, to others, to the environment around them. Maybe there's stuff on the cultural level. Maybe there's stuff on these deep meaning-making, sense-making frameworks. And I spent a number of years involved with groups that were really trying to, to figure out this like deep cultural operating system and you know how to live that, how to think about it, and make a kind of paradigm shift on that level. And I learned a lot, and it was also really challenging. And um, I've been 
yeah, trying to figure out how it's somewhere along the line in there. I started doing coaching, doing stuff from, uh, you know, pragmatic, helping people figure out their goals as part of these uh, goal crafting workshops. And um, the last couple of years, like getting more into the, the emotional untangling, the parts work, the trauma informed stuff, like trying to really get into what are the shapes that people's systems can get into that, that absolutely lead to different kinds of things that feel really frustrating and how can we get another perspective on that to like untangle it and open it up. And now I'm, I'm basically trying to just find places to bring all this together, um, to bring in the, the grounding in pragmatics and, and, you know, science and clear thinking and bring in the, you know, mystical experiences to whatever extent you can and bring in the different kinds of ways of making sense of the world and cultural frameworks and ways of relating to people and communicating. And I'm like, okay, where, what's, what's the next step? Like, where's, where is all this come together? Mm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, ge geographically, this is, you know, I, I'm from the Southeast US. That's where I went to college, to grad school. I've traveled and worked in Puerto Rico and Peru. And in the last five years, I've been up in Canada a lot, in Ontario, and now out in um, British Columbia. I'm on the southern end of Vancouver Island in Victoria, BC. So this is kind of where I find myself at this point. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that answer. I think, um, yeah, thank you for sharing it. It's, um, I really feel like people's life stories are so precious and um, that's why I ask about them. And I think that I really enjoyed the way that you answered that question quite a bit because it seems to me that answering this question can be a kind of art form in itself. And um, there are certain modes of answering that question that are you know common and easier to fall into which are reasonable that they'd fall into like a chronological like oh this happened this happened this happened like that makes sense that people would answer that question that way um but uh and th there's a couple of others that i've seen but I, I really liked the sort of structure that you gave that and uh sort of weaving together these different threads and uh giving an overview in that way and uh yeah it's it's beautiful to see some um novelty in the way that someone would answer this question. I like it quite a bit. So um, so maybe first I, I found myself curious about your childhood and I'm, I got sort of this image of you as a kid, like maybe being very curious or playful or something like that. And I wonder what, what your memory is of what you were like as a child and if any, any sort of salient moments stand out that were felt like they were defining or something like that if, if any come to mind they may or may not but i found myself curious about that yeah i mean as a as a child especially as like a a young child i was um i was i, I was really interested in like nature i would i loved going to the creek behind my grandfather's house and like just sitting there for hours and being like very engrossed in what are the crayfish doing? What are the crane fly larvae doing? What are, what are, um, you know, oh, are these snail eggs? Like what is happening in depth is way more engrossing than, I never really got that much into video games, but it was almost like watching the soap opera of this creek and all mm -hmm. the little dramas between all the different residents of it. Um, and, and that was like, you know, there was some isolation there too. There was some like easier to connect with going out in the woods or wanting to set up a terrarium or something. Sometimes then, then it's hard, harder to connect with deer sometimes. I had, I had a crew of good friends growing up. Um, they were kind of weird, nerdy folks together. And, and I was really fortunate to get into a, um, or to, to be supported by a, a 
highly academically gifted school, you know, public school program, because I think it, it would have been more of a struggle if the people around me had, if I'd felt like way more of an outlier in or not supported in class. And instead I was, a lot of my time and attention was kind of taken up with academics for, for, for better, for worse, that, that's just kind of how it was. So, yeah. Good. <laughs> That's that's one that's one aspect of, of things, I guess. Mm -hmm. I love that image of you sitting by the creek and watching the soap opera. <laughs> uh, that makes me curious as well about like, I feel like being friends with you over the years and, and watching you like, there's this, I see this love of science and a deep curiosity and um, a pursuit of questions and it's one it's foreign to me like I don't I don't have that same delight for science in the same way um, and then it's also inspiring you know it's like I, I can get a sense of that love from watching you have it and demonstrate it and share it and um, the question that I want to ask you about that is like a little tricky to put into words, but something like what 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 would you say is the heart of that curiosity or uh, investigation that that motivates you? Ooh, I like that. I like that. Like, what is the heart of it? It one word that's coming up is like connections or correspondence between things. Um, it, I noticed that I, it, there's a satisfying, almost like, like viscerally satisfying feeling when something like clicks into place in a way of like, oh, I get how this connects to this other thing and this other thing. It almost has a spatial location on a, almost like a tree of knowledge in, internally. Um, I have found a lot of challenge for myself in remembering arbitrary rule sets like programming language conventions. But for some reason, like the, the classification of bugs or um, different kinds of things about science that have a, a structure to it where I can even re-derive part of it from another, if I forget, that one's, that one's really, lands in a different way in my in my being hmm. um and there's also something like uh ah uh, yeah it's like oh what am i part of what what am i oh the heavy atoms in my body came from supernovas what does that <laughs> even mean <laughs> why would that how does that happen? Where did they come from? Like, that's amazing. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> there's, there's, there's so many of these rich connections that um, also pattern formation has, has just always been a, a big source of wonder. Like, because there's one way that people might think, even you might think in ancient times or something like, how did how did the tiger get its stripes? So well, maybe maybe some god painted them on. And there's a poetry in that. And there's also a poetry in realizing how the stripes can form of themselves. Like it's a, almost a, a bottom up god of stripe formation mm -hmm. as opposed to having to come in top down and do it. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Even and then to know those Turing patterns of the stripe formation are the same kinds of patterns that can even show up in activation, the waves of activation in brain regions. It's like mm. the same function of a pattern. It's just very exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what are some examples of the kind of correspondences you're talking about where you're like, oh yeah, this works the way this works and uh, inner symmetry that you're noticing? Yeah, I mean, one would be this this one of like 
you know, here's this mechanism that underlies both, you know, pattern formation in, in animal hides and also in brain activation. Um, another one that's sort of a shape of connection is, is like, uh, if I go out in the yard and there's some morning glory vines, I kind of just know like, oh, you know, these are the same family as a um, sweet potato, I think, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. It, it, it kind of reminds me of how my, my dad's a, a doctor and he, he would just always, he think he really wanted to be a small town family doctor because he would always just want to chat to people and say, oh yeah, you know, the, 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 what's the last name like the Hatfields are you kin to the Greenville Hatfields and it, it feels like asking this vine out in my yard like oh yeah are you, are you kin to the 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 convolvulaceae you know kind of thing uh -huh. Uh -huh. that's not really his accent but it, sure yeah. uh-huh oh that's sweet huh uh what would you say are the the like areas of science that you are most familiar with um, definitely ecology, um, bugs, plants, reptiles, and amphibians, um, decent amount of, you know, the stuff about like fish and birds and mammals and, uh, mm. the ocean is still pretty mysterious, honestly. I mm. now live by the ocean. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, that's how I feel about all of it my friend She's like I don't know there's a lot of stuff in this <laughs> science I hear there's this science thing you speak of. I'm, I'm making fun of myself but I'm not as ignorant as I'm making myself out to seem but not quite as knowledgeable as counteracting that would imply either and then and then like there's I, I have a I think a pretty good overview of a lot of like the big picture parts of um other stuff like how okay here's organisms in an environment but what's happening within an organism what's happening in their organ systems what's happening you know a little bit i have a little bit of the cell bio side of things and then you know the the chemistry underneath that once we get to physics, I would say I have a more of a pop science understanding of a lot of things from astrophysics to like tiny scale physics, because I just did not get in school beyond the very basic first levels of physics where you're like, okay, and like the ice skater pulls their arms in and they work faster, and then, which is really cool because you can even do it. But I wish I had more, I like, deeper understanding of being able to get into the equations of stuff. Mm. And that one's, that one's just been, that, that's been a challenge. Um, once it gets away from a certain kind of tangibleness, uh, I felt, I felt kind of limited on that. Um, but I, I love looking at, I love collecting, I have a whole Twitter thread of graphics that give a good sense of scale in different domains. Mm. And I love that kind of you know, communication of these are both for science and even stuff about economics like how much money is this compared to that like how much money is there in the world um and stuff like what is the mass of living creatures on earth what's the mass of humans and livestock and wild mammals and plankton and mm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm. I appreciate that you uh, answered that question. This is, this is sort of a poetic question and you answered it completely. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious to ask as well about um, ayahuasca, I guess, because uh, that's, that's a, like, something I've not experienced myself and I would be curious to hear how you would characterize it as a psychedelic and uh, what it what it was what it's like to take and maybe hear a bit more about the the time that you spent there. Yeah. Okay. Um, kind of feeling into like where to start. Um, yeah. I mean, ayahuasca is a 
mixture of two plants. Um, traditionally, the ayahuasca vine uh, has um, an MAOI in it, you know, which I'll go into a bit more later. And this, this other plant called chacruna has DMT in it. Dimethyltryptamine, uh, DMT by itself, if somebody um, smokes it or you know, there have been some studies where they've done intramuscular injections of it that will have a psychedelic effect by itself that's very short lasting, very intense. Um, and then, in, but if you just ate a bunch of it, it would do nothing because it would get broken down by enzymes that would, you know, it, it wouldn't get it to your brain. So this um, monoamine oxidized inhibitor, this MAY, it's in the, the vine, uh, slows down or halts that enzyme for a little while and makes it so the DMT can be absorbed into the bloodstream, get to the brain. Um, so these plants are sort of smashed and boiled and boiled and boiled and boiled and boiled and boiled for a long time. It gets reduced down to this sort of um, thick brown liquid that tastes like mud chutney paint it's a <laughs> bitter weird flavor sometimes sweet <laughs> um and uh, it produces uh, psychedelic effects that last you know usually about four to six hours but sometimes in these ceremonial settings they'll call people up to drink and then there'll, there'll be another hour and they may call people up you know, again, or even three times. And so that, that can extend the effects for you know, several more hours. Um, compared to psychedelics like LSD or mushrooms, um, ayahuasca has some, well, okay. So one difference is the, the common setting, um, which does have an effect on the subjective experience uh, and there's also a difference in the physiological effects. Um, ayahuasca often has an effect on people's balance. They, they call it the mariacion, or it, it, it's almost a little bit like if somebody just got off a boat and they don't quite have their land legs back. Mm -hmm. and so that can be kind of challenging. Uh, there's often a lot of pronounced gastrointestinal effects too. This, you know, the purging in terms of vomiting is is common it's it's often in this you know, traditional context it's sort of understood as part of the experience it's an opportunity to purge emotional spiritual stuff along with the physical act of, of vomiting mm -hmm. and there can be you know other parts of the gi tract involved as well so it's important to have good access to a washroom mm -hmm. um I found that the the uh, subjective parts of the experience, like I've I've really only taken ayahuasca in these ceremonial or shamanic settings. Um, it's a uh, sort of traditional home is in the sort of Amazon region of South America. Um, a lot of different indigenous groups there have a lot of different uh, traditions of of shamanic use. Uh, I think often at night, often in fairly dark settings because it does it does uh, cause you know, pupils to dilate people are very sensitive to light and um, there are also settings where those ayahuasca traditions blended with um, some of the some of Christian churches and the rubber tappers in different parts of South America sort of brought these together so you get these these ayahuasca churches that bring in aspects of Catholicism, aspects of African spirituality. Um, Santo Daime and the Unión de Vital are some of these churches that have really spread throughout different parts of the world. And they would, I think, usually have their ceremonies in the daytime, more structured, more hymns and like sitting up. Hmm. Um, and then people have also innovated with different kinds of neo-shamanic practices that can have all different range of, of settings. But there's, there's often this element of music and sort of a rhythmic music in a group setting, which, um, yeah, really, really, it moves the experience along in different ways. You know, the music can either be 
really resonant with someone's at or that it could kind of be dissonant and like bring stuff up. Um, I also find in my experience, it's somehow more likely to put faces on things. Like I, I generally very rarely or don't hardly get anything that seems like talking to, to entities or having any interactions with anything with a face in other kinds of psychedelic experiences. I mean, maybe if I lean really into some of the parts work style, um, internal work, but but uh, yeah, ayahuasca has this interesting property of, I, I, I tend to put, put faces on things. And, and I take that, I take a pretty um, metaphorical stance on it. You know, I'll kind of lean into that in the moment, in the, flow of that as like a narrative, as like a metaphor. And then afterward, I'll kind of make sense of like, okay, what did that mean? What, how does this apply to my life? I don't take those experiences necessarily super literally. I have known some people who do take them literally. And if they talk to aliens in ceremony, it means that those aliens are just as real as a table. And I'm like, mm. well, maybe. Mm. But that can that can get really confusing or disconcerting for people if they if they don't have that space to kind of interpret their experiences. How do you feel that the ritual element of the ceremonies impacts the experience of taking ayahuasca? Yeah. One factor is that you're not alone with it, um, which, you know, in a, in a ritual setting at least, which is, um, it, 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 it kind of means like, okay, you're not having folks go off and wander off somewhere and have a really distressing time by themselves but it also means that that sometimes if somebody really wants to just find a quiet place and that's what they need to recenter and ground themselves that can be harder to access some groups that do this ritual setting will have um you know a, a shaman or maybe two people like leading the ceremony and then other sitters, helpers, facilitators who are available to, you know, if somebody is having like, uh, if they, they're in some kind of like distress, they can kind of call for help and be moved to perhaps another space. And sometimes that is quieter where they can kind of like, you know, just really get away from the singing and, and kind of ground. Um, there's other aspects of the ritual that, again, vary from group to group. Um, I was working with Shipibo shamans, and they have an understanding of the, you know, the metaphysics of what's going on. That, you know, people might be um, that it is, it is there is there is sometimes warfare happening on the spirit level, hmm. and one of the tools they often use to kind of try and snap somebody out of a, a like if someone's like, oh, 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 I don't know what's going on. They might supply them, which is um, a cleansing with a sort of perfume, mist of perfume or some smoke from a pancho tobacco. And it would be kind of like taking a little bit of that smoke or the, the perfume mist and like kind of like on their, their head or something or along their back going like, and this can be a little bit like the sort of smelling salt of like, oh, someone's like, oh, I have a new sensory experience. I'm, I've snapped out of it. But I have sometimes hated receiving the perfume thing because sometimes it's been me just sitting there tripping and then someone spits on my head. <laughs> And it's disgusting. <laughs> it's not a mist. It's not a fine mist. It's just someone 
spitting on my head while I'm tripping in the dark. And I, I, oh, I don't like it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Also that perfume stuff, Agua, Agua Florida, it, it tastes like poison to put it in your mouth because it is mostly alcohol and weird chemicals and it burned, it gave me like kind of chemical burns in my mouth and made water taste like poison for hours. So I, I, I admit that I have some uh, <laughs> um, challenges in working with that particular shamanic tool. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I apologize for laughing at your suffering friend. Uh, no, that, this is, it is, it is, yeah. Uh, it was the most uh-huh. disgusting blessing I have ever received. Most disgusting blessing. Oh gosh, yes, yes. Uh, huh, huh. Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> hmm. What did your training involve there while you were still there? Yeah, I mean, so the first, um, the first thing I did, which. I, I don't remember who said this to me, but someone was reflecting that this is one of the most intense things that you can sign up via the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a shamanic initiation course, and it was six weeks of drinking ayahuasca every other night. Wow. Excuse me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. They also do a 10 week one. Um, what, what, what are the, what are the, what are the, uh, how to put it? I mean, like with acid, for example, you're not supposed to take it more than like once a week or something like that, right? Or there's some there's some time limits. What are the time limits with ayahuasca, right. if any? So, so with with LSD um, and sort of also with with mushrooms, there's a tolerance that builds up. But especially with LSD, it actually, you know, hangs out in this this receptor space and sort of pulls another part of the receptor over on top of it, and is like, ah, you know, if you, if someone took LSD one day and the next day and the next day, it would just stop having effects pretty quickly. Um, and then with something like MDMA, the reason for not taking it too close together is more of a like caring for your brain, caring for your whole system, not wanting to have side effects on brain function that are not what you want or mm. mood to. Um, for ayahuasca, it's basically Ah, well, as for, for smoked or probably intramuscular DMT, it gets that enzyme, it breaks it down so quickly that there's not really any lasting tolerance to it. Like one could um, take it again pretty soon. Hmm. Not necessarily recommended for the integration of it, but uh, so also for the, the oral mixture of of this ayahuasca, which is DMT plus this MAOI, um, it's basically that the once the 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 thing that suppresses that enzyme, once that runs its course, you know, it's going to be metabolized, and so it's there's not really this tolerance to it. Mm-hmm. There's there's I think it's pretty common for some groups to in different parts of the world host retreats that might be saturday sunday night or friday saturday sunday and say okay you know we're going to drink ayahuasca all all these nights or one or two of them so Hmm. um um, yeah the training i mean the rest of the training there was way more singing than i expected Hmm. (laughs) i did not really know going in how much of it would be about singing and memorizing songs in another language Mm -hmm. um this this i hadn't done much singing before that like i would sing show tunes with my friends in middle school (laughs) um but that was more about uh enthusiasm and sometimes volume than like trying to really uh create an experience or for other people or like fill this space or really pay attention to the resonance of my voice and um i really value that part of it like i've gotten way more into singing since then um and it's definitely in terms of like performance anxiety around singing it 
I don't have much because I have needed to face up to, all right, it's your turn to sing when I have been in a very altered state or somewhat nauseous or even in one memorable moment singing. And I was just like, Adi, Adi, you dude, like it's your turn. And I like, I need to go vomit. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, yeah, way more singing than <laughs> I thought. Yes. Um, we were also doing a lot of work with the plant spirit shamanism side of, of things, the kind of um, shamanic metaphysics, like understanding of the world where in that tradition, they would be doing dietas with these like sort of shamanic apprenticeships with a plant spirit um, and sort of doing these ascetic practices to try and create kind of a bond with this this plant spirit so that it would be available as an ally for healing in the in the ayahuasca ceremonies and I, I have some, I have a lot of different kinds of thoughts on this. I, I saw people bringing in a sort of neurotic relationship to some of those practices that I was concerned about, like in terms of, you know, this would be sort of a, say we were going to do a dieta with a particular tree, it would be like, okay, we would like, prepare an extract of the tree, maybe the maybe the bark, maybe the root bark, maybe the whatever, the sap or something. We would do a little short fast. We would sort of ceremonially like drink this, this extract of the, the tree, which often generally would not have a psychedelic effect. It would be more, I don't know, it wouldn't have a psychedelic effect by itself. And we would sort of go into this sort of contemplative period of, um, eating a sort of limited diet, like not much extra salt, sugar, fat, spice, um, refraining from a lot of kind of extra like stimulating activities, including we were told to refrain from sex or masturbation. Um, I mean, there wasn't like TV or anything there at the retreat center, so. Um, and, uh, you know, seeing like that kind of journaling or like seeing if any songs came to us or maybe meditating next to this tree or doing these kind of reflective things. The part I didn't, I mean, there were, there were some various parts that didn't quite sit well with me, but one was the penalties for breaking the diet. There were these sort of punitive understandings for if you transgress those like the things you're giving up, the things you're, this almost like a contract. And this idea that the penalties would be physical or emotional, spiritual ailments. And so somebody, people would get a little bit like freaked out. They're like, oh my God, I ate a tomato. Am I allowed to eat tomatoes on this data? Oh my God, oh my God, I'm getting hives. I'm getting hives. I'm getting hives. I think I like did it wrong. I think I'm getting punished by like a spirit. <laughs> or like if they got mm -hmm. diarrhea or something, it's like, Hun, you probably got diarrhea because we're in the jungle and like there's like weird bugs on stuff i don't think you train i mean i don't know <laughs> if you <tra> <laughs> like i don't want to make contracts with spirits that are gonna be punitive in these particular ways i don't i don't i don't like that aspect of it mm. um and and another thing that i i I cannot recommend the center that I did that training at because I think some of the way they worked with these other plants were not, I think, responsible in terms of like health and safety. Like they would give people some plant extracts that were used as fish poison mm. uh -huh. <laughs> and brought people to the edge of, I think, some pretty severe uh, physical health crisis points in ways that I don't know it's it's not the risk tolerance that I would it's not where I would draw my line for it and it's it's I don't think they really valued informed consent in a number of different instances that I that I saw there so mm -hmm. they, and including on the 10 week and I, I think since I did my 
initiation course there in 2014, I think they might have added more of the um, extra intense physically physical health challenging plant extracts, and I and I think they also do more of it on the 10 week course. So, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to um, sort of zooming out what your experience with psychedelics generally have been and sort of what role they've played in your life? Yeah. Yeah, I've often thought about like, what, how would my life have gone if I had never taken any psychedelic? Mm -hmm. And um, I think I would probably be an entomologist uh and probably have a much sort of like narrower range of emotional like narrower access to like emotional stuff um and probably just kind of more i don't know rigidity more just like okay these are the avenues in which i can function these are the settings that i want to like create for myself i'm gonna find success in these sort of narrowings and that's just going to be that's going to be my thing. I'm going to be like, find some niche, be an expert in it. That's my thing. Mm. Um, yeah. And I mean, so what happened instead is um, psychedelic experiences really got me in touch first with like wonder and awe. Um, I had this really deep, transformative experience where this song from symphony of science was going through my head and it's got you know auto-tune clips of carl sagan and folks saying we are a way for the cosmos to know itself mm. and i was just like oh oh dang like yeah like like we're like if, oh man if every, every organism has this unique vantage point on the existence and and we have this extra like self-reflective quality that like with this aperture through which the cosmos is like knowing itself and and loving itself and this is this is this is tremendous mm. and and that was really kind of the first alternative to this kind of misanthropic environmentalism that i that i'd had um it's like oh wow humans though mm. okay <laughs> And, and then, um, yeah, I think also like just different ways of um, having these glimpses of getting through some of the emotional like armoring and, and kind of like dissociation and cutting myself off from emotional stuff that I'd done to get by in, in different, you know, when I was younger. Um, and also some Buddhist flavored uh, changes in the shape of my sense of self kind of, and some of the earlier ones are more like, uh, I guess you could say like ego dissolution or kind of like um, that sense of self sort of dissolving and finding it reform like the way that uh, Apparently, if you like the, these these undersea animals, a sponge or a, or a hydra, this is a sort of little salt thing. If you push them through a sieve, through like a metal grate, and separate all their cells apart, I think this is probably rude, but they will form back together into functional little animals of like a sponge or a hydra, and that's kind of how I felt in terms of my sense of self, like having been scrambled and then noticing that there's a me that comes back together and then I think the journey from there has basically been like okay so there's this uh loosening of a sense of self and over the last year or so it's been more like okay but what about having a, a like a healthy ego though also mm. like a healthy functional honoring center of self also instead of just being really eager to kind of disregard that that center mm -hmm. yeah 
how would you characterize generally what psychedelics are and what the sort of opportunity that they offer people are? Ooh. What psychedelics are and what the opportunity that they offer people? One, one phrase that comes to mind is um, neural annealing. And this is a phrase that uh, folks like the, the Qualia Research Institute really like this. Um, I think the researcher Selen Adesoy, maybe Carl Friston also use this term. Um, annealing is something that happens in metalworking, like if you're making a sword or something, there's a state of, you know, banging on it with a hammer and folding it over and whatever. And it, it has all these sort of stresses in it that have gotten kind of hammered in and there's a, a heating it up until those electrons can all kind of move. And it sort of just like, it kind of like relaxes into the, the shape that it's in, all the old stresses that were about its previous shapes that got folded over and hammered, relax into its current, into being a good fit for its current form. And then you have to do other things to a sword to make it actually like hard and stuff. I don't know. But um, for people's minds, their mental pathways, their thought, action, behavior, their emotional reactions to stuff, I would say like the general thing that psychedelics can do is, is this annealing process, this kind of, it's not exactly a softening of things, but like, I think it's kind of a softening of boundaries of things or like things flow more. And some of these shapes of stresses and compressions that have come from like your previous environments sometimes it can give more of a oh now you can actually like relax that um and the preparation and integration of those experiences is is really important because I've, I've kind of said, you know, what are, what are psych, what was the question again? Like, Wait, what is, what are psychedelics? How would you characterize them? And what is the opportunity that they offer people? Yeah. Okay. How would I characterize them? What's the opportunity? I've said something that's really abstract. So I was trying to be really general. Mm -hmm. um, and if I was going to say it in like a, a um, a less abstract way. It might be seeing with with seeing something afresh, seeing seeing things afresh um, can be can be one way of of saying it. Mm -hmm. yeah. MDMA is a little bit different from some of the you know LSD mushrooms ayahuasca sort of psychedelics where it also additionally tends to provide people with this sort of almost like a life vest of okayness feeling it can be a sense of self-compassion or just like more capacity to look at material that can be challenging in a way that is not it doesn't feel as much like, oh, I'm going to get sucked into some really scary spiral or panic or despair. It has a bit of a life vest quality to it. How would you categorize the different sort of classes of these substances? Yeah, I mean, one way to classify them is, um, um, I guess, kind of more classical psychedelics, um, LSD mushrooms, mescaline, I mean, ayahuasca, uh, well, classical psychedelics, LSD and mushrooms, mescaline and ayahuasca have their own kind of characteristics to it. Um, 
intactogens or empathogens, which would be in MDMA as a, as a example, where there's more of these sort of heart opening effects, more of these um, feels, feels good in the body often. Um, whereas on the more classical psychedelics, body sensations could be good. They could be uncomfortable. They could be just weird, you know? Um, and then there's also dissociatives and, and deliriants or dissociative deliriants. So a dissociative would be ketamine, which is um, uh, used as an anesthetic. It's also being used sometimes for ketamine assisted psychotherapy where, um, or, or, or uh, ketamine IV infusion, which is more like just relying on the biochemical effects to probably alleviate depression for a couple weeks at a time. But they're trying to minimize the subjective weird effects. Whereas with the ketamine assisted psychotherapy, they're like, we're gonna dive into this altered state of consciousness and use it as a platform for doing some of the therapeutic untangling. Mm -hmm. um, but it often, I, I haven't experienced it myself, but from what I've heard, it's got more of a characteristic of distance from the body, but that can also be useful. Mm -hmm. um, and then stuff like, um, uh, uh, there's some weirder ones here. Um, uh, salvia, um, uh, stuff like Datura, 5-MeO-DMT, nitrous oxide. So some of the things like nitrous oxide would probably also be a, a short acting, it can work as an anesthetic, it can be a bit more of a dissociative, but also does produce these alterations of consciousness that, that people find interesting. Um, salvia is just weird. Mm -hmm. haven't haven't experienced it myself either but also as a it uses a different receptor works on a different receptor in the brain than all these other ones and it, people sometimes report that gravity turned sideways and they melted into their couch <laughs> <laughs> so um Detura is a delirium i do not recommend anybody try that mm -hmm. it's a dissociative delirium this is often a factor in some of um are you familiar with the website Arrowid? Yes. Yes. E R O W I D dot org. It is a compendium of trip reports and other information about psychedelics. And they have a section called Train Wrecks and Trip Disasters. Uh -huh. And a lot of the reports of Datura <laughs> and the related plant Brugmansia, Jimson weed, are people running naked through thorn bushes pursued by the police. It oof, oof, causes oof. true hallucinations that are indistinguishable from reality. In contrast to oh something is breathing or changing color it's like no someone is talking to a person who is not there and they cannot tell the difference that's rough uh -huh. <laughs> that's uh <-huh. laughs> yeah um 5-meo dmt i'm not exactly sure what people would classify it as it is also generally uh, smoked as a fairly short acting psychedelic um also some other routes of administration that are a bit longer lasting but it uh in contrast with dmt um it it the dmt tends to produce this profusion of forms and bizarre yeah you know shapes patterns colors geometries entities whereas 5 meo dmt tends to be more of like a centering thing like still very highly altering in the sense of state of consciousness, sense of time and space, but instead of like, there's a countless profusion of forms, it's more like oneness producing generally. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you answering that. I think um, uh, there's a principle that's coming to mind of, I think like, this is the sort of question like, oh, I could look up on say Wikipedia or Airwood or something. And, um, you know, certainly I've read things about this before, but I really liked hearing how you would characterize it and how you would describe it. And like hearing the tone of voice that you used or like the expressions that you made. And I feel like that adds a lot of character, even if it's a, a sort of basic question. It's like, oh, I want, I want to hear how Sarah would present this. And I, I really liked hearing that. So thank you. Cool. There's also a lot that I'm leaving out. 
Yes. But you, but again, those those charts are are pretty pretty handy. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about what you know. You had these experiences training as an ayahuasca shaman, and like it seemed like there were things you really valued about that, and things you didn't like as much that you didn't really feel like they did quite responsibly or the way that you might have liked. And I wonder how you think about um, psychedelic guides now and what, what, in your opinion, makes for a good psychedelic guide and a good journey that's supported by someone. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've thought about this question a lot. And I think that one way to go about responding to it is to break it down a bit into different contexts where someone might be in this role of a of a of supporting someone else in a psychedelic experience um i would break it down into a kind of peer trip sitter um a volunteer in a in a context uh, in a harm reduction context which i can say more about somebody who is in a professional or semi-professional role in a community um, psychedelic setting and then somebody who is a, a professional in a clinical setting mm. because these have these have different shapes to them and um, I think they need that some some of the characteristics that would be beneficial are, are common to all of them but some of them need different different roles different responsibilities you know um so the first one of like peer support trip sitter i think that the vast mid, like a, a big chunk of those train wrecks and trip disasters that get put on airwood a lot of them could have been prevented or mitigated made much less terrible if there had been a sober friend around mm -hmm. like okay so, we're not going to take our clothes off and run in the street now we're actually not going to do that exactly exactly or like you know somebody knocked on the door it's the fedex guy <laughs> that person's just gonna go get that and and that's gonna be the end of it it's fine uh -huh. um or the fire alarm goes off oh my god oh gosh you know or somebody's in the woods and they they step on a stick and like they're they, they're like oh let's go take mushrooms while camping well now they now they stepped on a stick and they 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 need some first aid who's gonna mm. who's gonna do that you know it's uh and I think for, for that kind of role, this is this the most important, I think, qualification for that. One is like, you, you know and trust the, the, the person, like the people have a good rapport. Um, and that the person who's being a sitter is uh, responsible enough in the way a babysitter would, like, you know, if if you can get somebody some water or a blanket or you can adjust the thermostat or you can adjust the music or answer the, the door or anything like that um it doesn't need and, and ideally you know so that's kind of the very most basic that would prevent again a lot of these running naked through thorn bushes sort of sort of experiences the, the next level up from that would be somebody who also is like has a decent amount of experience with this substance or has seen, you know, some people go through it or maybe they've gotten a little bit of training or like they, they know what is, they're able to, to kind of sit with somebody and say, hey, yeah, like this is totally within the realm of what might happen. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people go through this and come out the other side, you know, I'm here, I'm here with you in this and to 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 not themselves get freaked out and then have this amplifying feedback mm -hmm. loop of like somebody's on psychedelics and they do a weird thing and the sitter it gets a little bit nervous and that makes the person on psychedelics more nervous and it makes the sitter more you know so um those are those are some of the like that's kind of that first level of just like can you be there just accompanying somebody mm -hmm. um the second context I mentioned is uh, volunteering in some kind of structured way. Like I was the, uh, about a, a month ago or so, 
I was a co-lead for a sanctuary team at a regional Burning Man event. So we, you know, have, we have some, we do some trainings with folks beforehand. Um, and we are, we have a nice space set up at this event with cots and snacks and water and coloring books and pillows and blankets. And, um, you know, we have these volunteers on shift in the evenings. And if somebody is overwhelmed, either just emotionally, maybe they're having some conflict with their campmates, or if they've, they've, you know, taken some kind of substance and they're just they're having, they're feeling overwhelmed with it, they can come by or the rangers and medical can bring them by and we'll just sit with them, talk if they want to, provide a nice warm, dry space to lay down. And it's, and yeah, it can really help people have a much better experience. Um, and volunteers for that, it's simultaneous, it's, it's pretty much, it's similar to the peer supportive trip sitting. It's easier in some ways and more challenging in other ways. Like it's easier because you're not alone with it. You've got other folks to call on and the shift lead is somebody who's definitely gonna have a good amount of experience um, to draw on and they'll be able to, you know, you're, you're in this context basically. It's more challenging because um, you don't know the people who are coming in. They don't know you. You may have, you're coming in in the middle of the story. You may have no idea hmm. what they took, how long ago, how much, what their intention was going into this experience. You know, what's the context of their life? Did they have other mental health challenges that are going on? You know, did, did they just, did their dog just die? Like, you don't know what they're going through. And um, so instead of a, a friend trip sitting where the vast majority of the time it's going to go just fine, you are in a volunteer role, you're by definition meeting these people when something has already become challenging. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we'll do, we'll do some training beforehand of just like, you know, again, like what are what are these different kinds of psychedelics? What are the what are the effects? Um, what are some of the ways that this can go in challenging directions? Um, you know, people might not know, for example, that people's perception of time can become very altered. So they might you might think that like you just asked them a question and they should respond to you right then. Mm. It might take them a while to process it, or they might be in a kind of loop of thoughts that just sort of can be really disorienting. A lot of different things. Um, and then how to respond to that, just like different ways of taking care of yourself as a volunteer, grounding techniques for yourself and things that you can invite the, the other person into. Um, also talking about uh, you know, the boundaries, what kinds of touch are, appropriate for this setting, you know, how to ask people if they want a hand on their shoulder or if they want to, you know, sit back to back can be a really good grounding posture. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's some of the, that's that role. Um, the, so then these other two, somebody who's a guide in like a non-clinical setting and someone who's a, who's a therapist in a clinical setting. Um, a guide in a non, in a, in a community or non-clinical setting. It's kind of like, okay, what, what training or experience have they had? Um, you know, do they have a lot of experience with this substance? Um, with uh, sitting for people, are they in some kind of mentorship context? Did they get training? Did they get some kind of apprenticeship? Do they have, you know, uh, other people in similar roles that they can go and discuss things with if they have a challenging experience with, with someone that they're working with? Um, are they informed about physical health safety things? Like if this is a, 
um, retreat that's back in the woods somewhere, you know, or in a remote location? Do they have wilderness first aid? I would say at least wilderness first aid training or some kind of plan for responding to, you know, someone twists their ankle or something. You know, somebody, do they, do they know what, uh, if any medications are not a good fit with this substance? Do they know how to screen for that? Are they screening for other, you know, mental health conditions that might not be a good fit? You know, often schizophrenia is, is one of several conditions that like a lot of the clinical trials would say, hey, this is not a good fit for this study at this time. This could make your condition more challenging to navigate. We don't know how to support you in this. Um, what else? Um, are they, what kind of training do they have in terms of, you know, mental, mental health stuff? Do they know how to work with trauma? Um, do they have a plan for, you know, uh, you know, screening folks, doing some preparation, intention setting? Do they have a plan for some integration? Um, is there any other modalities that they bring in, in addition to the psychedelic, um, you know, do they do any kind of body work, somatic stuff? Do they do breath work? Do they do any kind of movement practice? Um, that's not required, but it can, can be helpful. Um, are you able to, like, do they exist in a context where if people had had weird experiences, you would know? Like ayahuasca centers often there are there are actually review sites. There's retreat.guru, there's iAdvisor as a website. There are some places where people can go and say, hey, I had a like, well, I had a really weird experience at this place. Or like, oh my God, this was so amazing. I felt so supported. Um, because unlike the sort of more clinical settings, um, there may not be a clear governing body for licensure or something. There may not be as much of a safety net for people. If there being some lines being crossed in terms of touch and relationships or something like that, there may not be as clear a reporting channel and oversight on that. So that is, that is a challenging thing where, you know, and I think there's an article called, there's a couple articles about like how to I think the Canadian Psychedelic Association has an article called Finding an Ethical and Skilled Psychedelic Guide Checklist, which was, which was pretty useful. Um, I'm actually looking at that now. And also, you know, uh, is the way this person is facilitating this experience a good fit for what you're wanting? Is there space for your, is this compatible with your metaphysical or spiritual views? Are you gonna be supported in, in making sense of this experience in a way that works for you? Um, there's also an article on 20 safety tips for uh, people participating in ceremonies with psychoactive substances from the Women's Visionary Congress, which is also useful. For, for more like ayahuasca kind of in particular. Mm -hmm. And then for people who are, who are in a um, psychedelic therapy role in a clinical setting, um, you know, in that case, they have a educational background, they have a licensure, they have a licensing board, they have a lot of uh, structures that are in place to where you may not have to do as much checking that they have, have had a had an, an education that that somebody has checked a box and said this is sufficient that there's been some some supervision and all that now what you might still need to sense into is what is their experience on the psychedelic side of things and also still like is their approach a good fit for you is their vibe a good fit like with any therapist like if you don't click with them then that just may not be a really good fit for, for that particular person to support you in this really deep work. Um, if they, now we're, we're still kind of on the cusp 
of therapists being able to work with MDMA and and psilocybin, like there've just been a few patients getting exempted in Canada to work with psilocybin. They're, they're on this cusp of expanded access for MDMA therapy in the US. Um, in those settings, if, if someone does, and also of course there's ketamine, there's the ketamine assisted psychotherapy, which is, which is legal. Um, now any doctor could prescribe ketamine and in those settings, I would really a key question is, has this therapist worked with this substance themselves? Um, I think all the training programs that I'm familiar with are, you know, have an emphasis on this because it's pretty crucial in my, in my opinion, but it is a different, it's a paradigm shift for somebody who might be, maybe they've been a psychiatrist for years and they're prescribing lithium and antipsychotics to people and they haven't taken those. Like, well, yeah, they might not, they might not, it, 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 it's different for the psychedelics, I think, to, to really be able to know what somebody's, what it's like in there. So, If someone's having a difficult experience emotionally or psychologically on one of these substances, um, what do you think a guide can do that goes above and beyond just making sure they don't say physically harm themselves or make some choice that they'd regret later? Like what can someone do to support them in that experience? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, of options there. Um, I do think the first thing is is really this like grounding grounding yourself like as somebody in that in that role um, as much as possible just kind of all the techniques that you might offer somebody else like also see if you can yourself like feel your feet on the floor feel your weight supported by the earth like um, notice yeah it, it it also it depends what kind like the the particular thing that you might invite them into also depends on what's the nature of the the challenging experience that's happening um like one outside of psychedelic experiences one classification might be is the person what's the state of the person's nervous system are they in a kind of like um, sympathetic nervous system like fight or flight like agitation like tension like heightened kind of like this energy or are they like um are they in kind of like a dissociated or like collapsed or like or like really frozen state that's that's kind of like beyond that tension it's sort of like oh my god some part of me is just preparing to to die or something mm. um so because those have different um responses uh somebody who's in that like really collapsed kind of state uh or, or like sort of like you know, kind of dissociated collapse kind of state. One thing that, um, you know, trauma therapists and I'd recommend is see is if you can get them to just start to make even little micro movements. Like see if you can even get them to move like their toe or their finger, or even just like move their tongue a tiny bit where nobody even can see that they're moving. Mm -hmm. And maybe draw the person's attention a bit to the surroundings. Now, <laughs> this could be weirder on psychedelics because I actually, so there's this exercise called five, four, three, two, one. It's named five things that you see, four things that you feel, three things that you hear, two that you smell, one that you taste. And it's, it's in, in, from a baseline state of consciousness, it's really good at helping people who are in some kind of traumatic memory reconnect with the scene around them 
and be like, okay, I see the doorknob, I see the nail on the wall, I see the, and they kind of bring it back to the present. I found myself doing this in a dream once. Mm. Mm. And that is like really weird because, and I was like so glad that I was, I had that reflex because something freaked me out in a dream. And I was like, okay, okay, five things I, but in a dream landscape, stuff shifts around. And so orienting to the present <laughs> moment is like not as grounding. Yes. And um, yeah, but I think there's still, there's, you can adapt it to, to psychedelic. You, know, you can give people a big flat, smooth stone to hold, or mm. sometimes, you know, again, sensory experiences, like putting a little bit of lavender oil on a thing and seeing if they just, like, oh, here's a, here's a sensory experience that's different, or here's a really soft blanket, or here's a warm um, hand warmer or heating pad or something. Mm -hmm. um, or like, let's go change the scene. Let's see if we can, you, know, you wanna walk with me around outside here or... So those can be some for this, this sort of like, more like, uh, sort of state for the kind of like ad actively agitated state there's kind of like two directions you can go from there you can either try to take the energy like down into more calming or you can keep it at that kind of intensity but shift it from agitated and like maybe i'm trapped maybe i'm powerless maybe like this isn't okay to like more empowered deliberate movements and even more playful and that can sometimes be more accessible than trying to just take it back down into calm is to to sort of like you know maybe maybe like okay what if what if like some jumping you know what if like some like stomping or like make the movement bigger or like stretching or or you know some of these things like that can um can help there's also like breathing things that can go along with both of shifting from either of those states um like shifting from that that collapse state is often some of these more like energizing breaths shifting from a agitated state to calm is often like box breathing or the out breath longer than the in breath like breathe into a count of seven breathe up to a count of 11 things like that hmm. yeah what do you do if in either of those states someone isn't communicative or doesn't seem to understand what you're saying or something like that? Yeah, that's why that's why I kind of was like, you know, here's here's what you would do from maybe a base. Here's some things yeah. you could do from a baseline state of consciousness. Added on to that is all of the complexities that can be happening in a psychedelic state, which makes it a little bit more challenging to answer this question of like, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Because you know, again, somebody's sense of reality could be very different. They could also be projecting onto you that you're a god, demon, alien, their kindergarten teacher, a bunch of different things. Um, can you can you ask the question again? Like, yeah, just what do you do if they're not communicative or you your words don't come through or they don't seem to respond or something like that? Yeah, I mean, sometimes if there really is not a clear way to if you're not sure that they're like aware of you being there sometimes they're just there's a kind of acceptance that they're just going to go through what's what they're going through right now and you may not even be able to be certain if when they come back to an awareness of their surroundings if they're going to say that that was hellish or that was super important because like it can look weird somebody can be like making weird motions mm -hmm. and like making weird sounds but it like turns out that that was a blissful experience mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the inside like um so sometimes there's just kind of a like just being there and mm -hmm. and and refraining from intervening mm -hmm. um Yeah, like I think for some of these, kind of like you have to, I had to have to be there to kind of sometimes like, okay, what would what would I do in this situation? Um, so it really depends on like what's what what I'm noticing. You can also even just say 
sometimes like if somebody is like if if you think that they're giving cues that they they may think they're in like an unsafe environment you can without necessarily like invalidating what what they're experiencing you can just say like hey i'm here from where i'm sitting this is a safe situation everything's okay where i'm at here with you um it may not get through it may just the tone of your voice might get through mm-hmm. um sometimes reminding people to just like breathe into areas of tension or just um yeah seeing if they can be with be with that if they can call in any other kind of grounding stuff any areas in the body that feel that feel grounded any you know sometimes people like to invite in visualizations of a a space that is comforting and grounding or a a, a being a, a some somebody they have a fond memory of a caring grandmother or a spiritual figure or a teacher or a some of those work better though if you know the person beforehand and you have some some time beforehand to kind of um prepare some of those mm-hmm. visualizations mm-hmm. 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 i appreciate you going into some detail about this it's a unusual set of skills that uh seemed interesting to ask about so yeah uh, i mean it's also it's 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 um there's a lot of overlap with the kind of there's a lot of overlap with some of the stuff that i would do from a baseline state of consciousness with a coaching client working with grounding the body and then there's some things that are more specific to the psychedelic states um and there's a the the zindo project manual is a good one for some of these like um what might people do if they're supporting folks in this case uh at burning man in this sort of yurt for folks who are having feeling a little overwhelmed um yeah can you tell me more about the coaching that you do and how you work with people and what sorts of modalities you tend to use yeah so my coaching tends to have um, kind of three different aspects. Like one is pragmatic kind of goal setting. Uh, and a lot of this is, is drawing from the um, goal crafting intensive workshops that I started helping out in 2018. And we're, it's, we're actually still running them. In fact, there's going to be one in September, um, which I can say more about later if I pull up the exact dates but it's it's basically like okay what is somebody what does somebody want like what is their big picture visions what's their dreams like how to bring those into more concrete contact with like going from like that big scale to next steps to like all the parts in between and um i've had some coaching clients who mainly just want to like have a quick sort of check-in call once a week and sort of go over like what's their goals for the week have they run into challenges do they want to like refactor any of those and then also like even for folks who mainly come in wanting help with these pragmatic aspects often we'll get to some thing where they're like i keep wanting to do this but i notice that i end up doing something else the classic one is like procrastination or um uh yeah just like like why do i keep having this p- pattern of like thought or feeling or, or action that i i don't understand why it's happening i don't like it it's bothering me in my life and then there's just kind of this whole toolkit for working with internal conflict and um this is like uh my, my framework for this or like the backbone of my practice for this is coherence therapy mm or coherence coaching, which is the same material, but just with a different scope of practice. Um, And I've actually been getting formally trained in this. um, I'm on on the path to being certified as a coherence coach, which is, feels pretty cool. Mm. 
and uh and it's a lot about like okay uh it's it's a framework in which a lot of other modalities can be can be fit into there's this book unlocking the emotional brain where folks looked at therapy sessions and they said okay when this worked when this produced a lasting change what were the necessary elements that had to be there for this to really click and they said okay well the elements that show up in all these sessions or something actually shifted were that the the therapist and client got really clear on why this response to the situation made sense in terms of what some part of them learned about the world at some point in the past like this is how the world works and it's kind of like this narrow view but like in that from that viewpoint of the options available this makes deep sense and all of the things that that's causing the harms that that's causing are acceptable losses because it's preventing an even worse predicted outcome again from this viewpoint and it's getting in touch with that from an experiential place not just sort of like talking about it from this like conceptual place but like stepping into what it feels like to in like inhabiting the perspective of to some part of me it feels deeply true that the world works in these ways these are my only options and among those options this is the best one and then simultaneously also inhabiting the point of view that you know something different about the world that's like you also know that from this other perspective there's more options or the meaning is different or the world works in a different way and going back and forth between those and gradually like bring them into contact and it can be kind of like uncomfortable or disconcerting to to like have these incompatible to step into incompatible viewpoints but what what happens is that your system updates like bringing that activating really stepping into the the space from which it makes deep sense this thing is happening unlocks it basically and makes it available to 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 also take in everything else you know um yeah and have and have like a better strategy for caring for what this part of you's been trying to care for um in contrast to something like cbt cognitive behavioral therapy which seems to be more like about installing an internal referee to keep these fighting parts of you to like you know ah oh, that was out of bounds you know that's a irrational thought like kind of like keeping them in line the coherence therapy framework is more about helping these parts in conflict like realize that they're on the same team mm. and and be able to to work together in not just work together to to integrate i guess to mm -hmm. be be like okay there's something that has been so important not to get lost and how do we honor that while also not having to keep this compartmentalized hmm. ah, here's one of those places where i'm like okay i want to get back to the question you asked which is like what are my coaching things because i was like there's pragmatic there's like working with internal conflict um, i'm just going to say pragmatic working with internal conflict working with grounding if, if that internal conflict stuff ever gets like overwhelming or distressing and then there's also psychedelic integration as kind of like another branch that some people want to talk about, which may also include getting in touch with your goals, working with internal conflict, you know, weaving these insights back into your life and working with grounding if uh, it ever gets kind of distressing or overwhelming. Yeah. And so the grounding would be a lot of the techniques we already kind of talked about, you know, somatic practices um you know working on the level of body sensations working on the level of movement or breathing or um i haven't done as much with 
visualizations like ideal parent uh, figure meditation, but stuff like that also is useful. Hmm. Can you give an, a, like a concrete example of this kind of um, memory reconsolidation that coherence therapy talks about? Yeah. Me. It could be fictional. It doesn't have to be a real one, but just like a plausible one or even a real one, either is fine. Let me think of one that's either. That's like sufficiently fictional. Um, <laughs> I just want to grab the the book of it, but um, feel free if you like. That's not a bad idea. I, I'll try. I'll try to just kind of improvise it. Like say, one of the examples they use in the book is um, say that somebody is, you know, at work, they, every time that they like want to, to speak up in a meeting about an idea, uh, they just get this like, ugh, and they don't want to do it. They're like, God damn it. <laughs> but they, they kind of, they feel like they should, they, they've missed promotions or they feel like they're missing out on stuff. And so they talk to, a, let's say someone who's doing coherence therapy, they talk to a therapist and the therapist says, okay, so let's um, describe for me in detail this scene where you experience this like um, block to speaking up. And so they kind of go through and they're saying, okay, I'm in this board meeting and I know that I've got this like good idea for the direction the product could go. And I just like, I take a breath, but I feel this like sick feeling in my stomach. And I just, my throat closes up and I just can't say it. I'm like, okay. And, you know, they might go into that sensation. They might go into when was the first time you felt this. They might kind of say, okay, what will, if, if, if I speak up and just complete that sentence a couple of times, like if I speak up, oh, they're all gonna, they're all gonna laugh at me. If I speak up, they're gonna, they're gonna criticize my idea. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna laugh at me just like, just like Miss Smith did in second grade. And they're like, oh, tell me more about that. Like, um, you know, and maybe th this person had a teacher that just was very critical of their ideas, like as a kid or whatever it is, but maybe there was just some experience that like, oh my God, they learned that like every time they spoke up, they were going to get criticized. They were going to get picked on, sneered at, whatever. And so, you know, there's like kind of help them just like be with this experience of like remembering, oh my God, like that's how it felt to be this kid in this, this class where every time I raised my hand, like this would happen. And then also, and so, so to see like, oh, it makes deep sense. Like if, if this is how the world works, every time I raise my hand, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get criticized and picked on it makes deep sense to not speak up in a meeting because there's this assumption that if you did, you would get, you know, brutally picked on, mm -hmm. even at the cost of maybe missing on some of these, these promotions. And so then it'd be kind of like, okay, is there anything else you also know about how the world works? Like, have you noticed anybody else um you know what happens if somebody in this board meeting speaks up and even if somebody doesn't like their idea you know is it is it brutal is it like what does it mean about them do they get do they get how, how's criticism handled there like how's feedback handled and also like you know might even sort of invite this are there safe ways to try out speaking up and see if the same thing happens or see if there's a way for, you know, a different, to invite a different experience and kind of do this dance of trust with this part. Are there any settings where they've had this experience of like uh, speaking up and something different happened? And often there's, there's, there's some route to that, whether even, even like imagining, even like taking, walking it back and imagining 
redoing that scene from a sense of accompaniment from your adult self or whatever it is to kind of do an empowered reenactment of that scene that was so difficult. And once the person can even really like imagine it going differently in that kind of embodied way, that's often a, yeah, a route to, to um, un, unwinding that sort of, uh, uh, some, like, like deep learning of like the only way the world works is that if this, then that, and can open up a more space for, for other kinds of actions, for you know, speaking up in those situations in a way that's not just like suppressing or pushing away this constriction or this fear, but is saying, hey, yes, you know, thank you fear for wanting to keep me safe in this way, for warning me about the situation and I've got it. Like I'm a different person now, I'm actually an adult. I can take care of myself in ways that that kid back in that classroom didn't actually have access to. So this is, it's a different setting now and it's worth betting on speaking up in this way. Hmm. You know, with a lot of these therapeutic, psychotherapeutic modalities, I think internal family systems and parts work are kind of in vogue. And I know you've done some of that work and I wonder how you would characterize the relationship of a parts work type modality, whether it's internal family systems or, or something else and its relationship to coherence therapy. Yeah, like parts work and internal family systems are among the, the modalities that work really well um, with this uh, coherence therapy framework. I mean, I've seen, I've seen a therapist who did both of those together and the combination is, is very fruitful. Mm -hmm. The coherence therapy folks also talk about other methods that work well. Um, Hakomi is one of them. Um, I'm not sure which other ones. DBT might have been one of them. I'd have to, I'd have to kind of look. Um, but the the parts frame is uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, coherence therapy is kind of a parts practice internal family systems brings in more structures of um, managers and firefighters and exiles and practices for unburdening exiles that um, aren't necessarily part of like this this backbone or framework of coherence therapy but they can definitely um, I especially find the IFS stuff useful in terms of um, checking in with somebody about how they feel towards the part of them that is carrying this uh, strategy for responding to the world. And often if somebody feels like angry, frustrated, upset with the part of them that is, uh, you know, holding this, this, this strategy, I'll dip into some of the stuff from IFS to uh, help see if we can like get grounded in like a bigger, more expansive sense of self that can hold both of these parts, this scared part in the angry, frustrated part that wants to fix it already or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I've really admired your Rome research page for some time. I think you call it How to Human. And uh, I think it's uh, a labor of love and a great service to people. And I've you know, always enjoyed uh, running through the pages there. And if there's something that I'm interested in, you often have a really good page about it. And uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's been a really valuable resource. And I have wanted to ask you about that and sort of how you started it and what it's been like running that project and yeah. Um, if you would be willing to speak to that. Yeah. So I had had, I don't even know when I started many, many years ago, a, a bookmarks folder called How To Guides for Being Human. Mm. And then I think it would have been, 
about 2019, I um, started this Rome uh, you know, notebook. I call it kind of like a public notebook for my coaching practice. And I was putting stuff in there that I was learning. It might have actually even been early, early 2020 when I started it. But I, I started putting stuff in there that I was learning as a way to kind of keep track of it myself, but then also um, to share parts of it with other people. To be like, oh yeah, you wanted links about core transformation. Here's this, you wanted links about um, some of the psychedelic therapy stuff. Like here's all this. And uh, yeah, it's really grown. It's there's a lot in there. <laughs> and it's it's still extremely useful for me um as a reference, as a kind of helping almost like a spaced repetition thing because I'll I might throw a link in there and then come back when I'm looking at that topic and say, "Oh, I actually want to go do a deeper dive." into that blog post, that YouTube video, that book chapter. Um, yeah, keep book notes in there. I, um, it's, it's, it's been, it's been, I think I would, I have no idea how I would organize all that information actually without something like that. It's like making my own wiki, mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> yeah. I, I sent a page of it to a friend the other day and he had been talking about the virtues that he's found in like writing things out longhand in a, a paper notebook. And he said something like, I can tell that you typed this, mm -hmm. you know, that you, that you didn't write it longhand first. Um, and he kind of indicated that he would have preferred reading something that came from a medium where you have this economy of words, you have to kind of think about what you're writing. And, and I was, I was sort of affronted. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you, if you cuss on your podcast. Generally, you are but... welcome to, <laughs> I need to add that to the page that I send people because people often ask me this, you are welcome to cuss on it. <laughs> well, my first internal reaction was like, was like, Bitch, excuse you. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but then I also like, like, kind of took it in, and it, it, there's some useful feedback in. The, well, for the, another part of me was like, man, Sarah, like, this is a first draft of stuff. It is explicitly a place where you throw a bunch of things in and you iterate over time to streamline it. Because if you were trying to wait till everything was polished, it wouldn't be the same thing. It, you mm -hmm. wouldn't get all this stuff that you're that you're doing but i there is i think some useful feedback in what he said about um i think sometimes i relate to some of this information the way my uncle's dog big, big labrador buster would relate to food or just kind of like whoa, 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 like inhale the food and we're like buster did you even taste that <laughs> so i think sometimes there is this like information I'm just like oh okay okay we stuffed all in there something on there and like did I did I pause to let that in mm. and where's the sort of rushing coming from so there, there is there is something I think I want to explore more with that there's because there's some parts of it that I feel like I have really metabolized and others that I've just sort of like grabbed and shoved in a piled mm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I think that's a real trade-off I mean uh I forget if I said this to you anywhere but sometimes I fancy myself that the the blog that I run is like a sister project to what you're working on you know there's a lot of overlap and I'm always pleased to notice when you link to my blog in the how to human things like uh yeah it's nice to have these sort of like complementary information you know resources and um i think that the way that you're doing it seems to me like seems like you can cover a lot of breadth and like you know here's a lot of good links and like connect dots and things like that and then when i write those blog posts i mean it can take years to write some of those posts i mean that i've written um the fundraising one that i wrote which isn't directly related to that topic of course but that one took that one took literally two or three years to write um and some of them certainly take months and 
um, even a shorter one will take 10 or 20 hours to write. And uh, that that's an investment. So to me, it makes sense that sometimes like that you'd want a different trade off of like, you know, just here's a page that has like four links and that's it, you know, like, here you go if you want that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I want to also sort of um, distill out more polished pieces from mm -hmm. that. that, that mm -hmm. uh, I th yeah, there, there's definitely a desire for that to kind mm -hmm. of say, okay, here's this sort of scrappy, messy thing. And then, oh, here's some, some fruits from that that are mm -hmm. more polished. Yes. What would you say that you've learned from running that project, like just in terms of like information management and like actually running the wiki and things like that. Have you learned any lessons from that activity just about how to structure it or how to put it together? That's a good question. I mean, I think, I think it would be a lot harder to do without Rome or something like Rome that has the the backlinks. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like it just kind of created itself, honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I do notice that um, there are some things I do that not everybody who is using Rome does. Mm -hmm. Like whenever I um, make a new page, so for, first of all, I do have an index page. It's not like exhaustive, but it, it does give some intro to like where people might might click around in there and i do kind of try to have some of these structures are a bit like hierarchical or nested um then i also at the top of each page i have a kind of like related or see also um to like other pages which you don't necessarily have to do because rome would um at the bottom link to things show you all the pages that link to this topic but i do find it like i like doing it manually up there too because it helps me it helps me curate that more mm -hmm. and then i also try mm, as much as possible not to have completely blank pages that are sometimes like, even, even i'll just maybe some of us say this is just a placeholder like I don't have anything else on here, but but I try to at the minimum if it's some like topic that has a Wikipedia page, at least link to the Wikipedia and like quote a paragraph. Just so if someone clicks on it, they're like, oh, that's what that is. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any hopes for the project in the future? That's a good question. I think that I there's a lot of good information in there, but I think that my next steps are stuff like creating more like original content and then also putting it together in forms that are easier for people to access and work with. Because what it what it is right now is more like if somebody is like if somebody is coming at this, it's kind of like I wrote what I would have liked to have, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, ten or fifteen or I don't know, however many years ago, like that that I don't even know if. I don't know how, if I would have had the foundation or background or context for this to be interested in this, but like, it's a, it's, it's of a structure where you can get kind of uh, lost like in a Wikipedia hole of like clicking through things, but they're all like useful and interesting. But I would like to have more, again, um, guided, structured ways for people to, break some of the material down into more like a, a skill tree or a tech tree or something like from a video game. Mm -hmm. And like, here's a course on this part. Here's like this part, here's this part. Um, in ways that are just like more structured and more supported. Hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that like one of the 
almost really aesthetic principles it seems like it's like creating the thing that you wish you'd had before and I really I, I don't know it's sort of obvious when I realized it but I realized that last year like that's the gold standard for especially this kind of writing that I do I do other kinds of writing as well but it's like this piece of currently I'm calling it like informational blog posts uh when mm -hmm. I write in a blog it's like I want to deliver the thing I wish I'd had when I started and um that does help me digest the information like as a learner but also pass that on to someone else where like you know knowing whatever it is that would be useful to know at the beginning rather than you know months or years into learning about the thing um that can sort of save someone else time or confusion or what have you yeah and 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 one of the other early motivations for this was wanting to put together emotional resources for somebody who's close to me who's younger than me um and i don't i don't even really think that person has used it that mm -hmm. much but that was definitely like one of the one of the motivations mm -hmm. compassion yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh, um so when you work with people as a coach, you are doing so in like a formal relationship, but I know a lot of these modalities are also used in a sort of self-therapy context. And what advice would you give someone that is using them as a self-therapy technique? Yeah, so a lot, yeah, modality, using modalities in a self-therapy context. Um, Two of the main roles of, well, no, maybe three. Okay, three of the main roles that I would see a therapist or coach or whoever providing that you would need to figure out how to help provide for yourself in a self-therapy setting. Um, one is, I'm going to say, like, metacognition. One is, like... Um, nervous system co-regulation and one is like keeping you from doing the modalities too hard on yourself mm -hmm. <laughs> so okay metacognition regulation and then like d don't push yourself so hard mm -hmm. that it stops working um the first one especially in some of these techniques where you are doing a mix of what IFS would call blending and unblending from parts. You're stepping into a perspective, you're, you're getting some information and context from that, you're stepping back out into kind of this more like meta perspective, you go into a memory that has a feeling in the body that might be a lot, that might you know, then you're kind of going back into oh there's also the rest of your body are there any spaces that feel grounded like um taking notes can be challenging when you're doing this blending and unblending and like navigating through the practices can be challenging so that's especially for the coherence therapy stuff it's especially for stuff like core transformation which i think is a really handy useful parts work practice but it does have a lot of notes that are important i've had some ideas for an app that would help people self-facilitate core transformation um actually there's a message i didn't reply to that i need to um follow up with someone who is like interested in maybe collaborating on that because something like that where you could with as little friction as possible, either like record a voice clip or just a word or two typed about what's going on at that point. You kind of like go down a chain of things and you go back up and it's, so yeah. So, so one thing you can do to translate between modalities from a therapy context to self-therapy is something like journaling or even using an automated transcript thing like Otter and talking and like recording yourself talk 
and like pausing it and then maybe reading over what you said or um that that can be one way of like hel helping not get lost in the in the thing um you can also use parts work things that are shorter like feeding your demons is a shorter parts work practice you can more easily follow along with a recording a kind of guided meditation it's like the not iterative version of court transformation mm. um so that's that's something about the like there's this blending unblending note-taking metacognition role that you'll need to find some way to to do that if there's no therapist um the second one was nervous system co-regulation um and so this is the, the the things you would need to again create for yourself would be noticing your state of nervous system activation and like noticing when you're starting to get overwhelmed or triggered in some way figuring out different ways to respond to that and um having this meta stance that there's a book called Your Resonant Self by Sarah Payton that, that she would call it something like cultivating a resonating self-witness. Um, IFS would call this stepping into self-energy. Um, it's definitely also related to the ideal parent figure meditation from, I forget the name of the person's course. Dan Brown Dan and Brown. Cedric who's created the course. Yeah. So there's stuff from all of those modalities that gets at this um, reparenting yourself kind of. It's like the the loving presence. I think it meta also meditation, I'm sure, as a as you know, toward others, toward self, would help cultivate this grounding uh both like nervous system regulating experience, a, a, a metaphysical stance of self-compassion, a felt sense in the body of there being some space of relaxation, calm, groundedness. Um, this one's a little bit, this is definitely one of those things that I really, one of the key things that I want to uh, create uh, an offering for people to help them create this for themselves because it's the thing that a therapist is supposed to 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 do to hold you in the space and help you find it yourself not everybody's good at that or not everybody like necessarily you know that not necessarily part of every therapy session but the books that I find that are most useful for it are this Your Resonant Self has some guided meditations about it. And um, Somatic Internal Family Systems Therapy has several routes to um, like step into this, this, this energy, this self-compassionate energy that's grounded in the body through different modalities of like breathing and movement and um, attunement to body sensations and other things like that. Mm. So, yeah. And then the, the third thing was like <laughs> many, many people that I know who have gone into um, I'm going to, I'm going to do therapy on myself, like including me sometimes, but like, one thing that people sometimes report is like, it's not quite like not knowing when to stop, but it's like you have one hammer and everything looks like a nail and like just pushing yourself really, really intensely in one modality in a way that has some kind of backlash. Often because in IFS terms that pushing is coming from a part again there's like how do you feel toward you know a fearful or young part of yourself if you're feeling frustrated or impatient 
that's going to make it a lot more difficult or like you're going to have a dissonance friction fight internally as opposed to if it's come you're like okay i feel oh, i actually feel really like i feel a lot of care toward this part like man this part has had a really hard job to do god mm. like that's gonna that's often gonna flow a lot easier um so some mechanism of checking in with yourself maybe with others too of like noticing like man this thing stopped working should i do it harder or should i um, <laughs> harder I think, harder yeah Definitely. yeah 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 that's the part where i think people can get themselves into knots is like they're like i should just do it harder at myself so maybe you know having some folks that you talk to about stuff mm -hmm. like this maybe it's make an anonymous twitter account maybe it's mm. find some other pocket of folks online <laughs> um maybe gosh uh, is there any friend in person that you can talk to or uh, on the phone of like man i've been doing <laughs> some some weird modalities on myself and i feel this way and mm. or maybe getting a tune-up from a pro at various points mm -hmm. even if you mostly like self-modding your car uh -huh. <laughs> that's a good metaphor for it uh, i'm reminded of that one of my favorite tweets uh from moon boy that's uh about uh you know basically if you've tried being mindful and compassionate and still doesn't work then you're a piece of shit and uh, <laughs> yeah as as i love I, I said this somewhere but i love i love that tweet because it's like a very specific style of humor that i i almost never like make jokes like that but it's like hilarious anyway it's just like who who amongst us has not had that kind of a thought before when we've been doing these modalities like clearly i'm a fuck up you know <laughs> whatever i mean i don't know but uh it's just kind of funny to laugh about afterwards but you know it's in the thick of it it's it's it can be a mess. So, uh, I like that metaphor of of you know checking in with a mechanic, sort of if you like to tune your car yourself, but maybe occasionally it's good to get a tune up or some support. And I think for myself, like I, I you know I lean towards the self therapy stuff partly, yeah, partly um, out of like a sort of cavalier explorer mindset, and partly out of like logistical constraints. Um, but I think it really affords a lot of um extra space to have someone hold like hold the container and also um i think it's really it's been really helpful to me to to like if there's a new modality i want to try to work with someone that's more familiar with it gain the skill and then often i can kind of internalize that and be like okay that's how the move sort of works and i can do it on my own after that but um i think that there is i don't know i think there is a value to doing these things on your own that's maybe sometimes underemphasized in the like Way that they're presented them um maybe in more formal settings not not in, not so much in teapot or on twitter but like you know if you read if you, i mean for example i i don't recall um i could be misremembering but i read the coherence therapy book a while ago and i i didn't recall too much mention of like oh you could do this on yourself kind of thing and um you know you can so uh yeah i think a lot of the like traditional psychological presentations tend to like emphasize like oh you're working with a therapist and there's this formal container and and that makes sense but in practice some of the techniques at least you seem to be able to do by yourself um, especially you know if you have um had the ability to like learn what exactly it is and how to do it and that kind of thing and i think there's a balance to be struck there of like when is it good to do self-therapy and then when is it um good to really work with a, a therapist or a coach or something like that yeah yeah, I really, I really like what you said about um, for some modalities, like giddy, like starting off with with somebody who's familiar with it, and then when you've got it, you're like, oh, this is how it feels when it like clicks. I can find this again. Mm -hmm. Then taking that more into, you know, your own practice, which, as you said, has more can have more spaciousness, can have more like you're not constrained by um, a certain 50 minute or an hour, an hour and a half window on a calendar that you had to pick beforehand. <laughs> you, can, you can do it when it comes up, when it's like alive for you. Um, 
you know, you can, it can go as long as you want to, you can dip into other things. If you need to like go stomp around and wave your arm to the backyard and be kind of weird for, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think, I think sometimes like, let's say something like, like this core transformation thing, uh, which I can describe a little bit more, but like if somebody is just reading the book maybe and they they keep trying and trying, but they don't actually hit one of those kind of core states that is the, I don't know, key to that particular practice. I would say to, as you said, go and see if you can practice it with somebody else who can help you get there and then once you know what it feels like it's like oh okay that is probably going to be a better like starting point for doing more of it Mm -hmm. because sometimes things just have a like I'm thinking of even just like acro yoga moves or something there's often a like sometimes people who just practice from like trying to see a video and then they try to go practice it there may be some aspect of that move that is hard to get from just watching it. Like there's some cue that those instructors didn't quite give that you need a different cue to really, and then it clicks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think in my own experience, like um, I'm remembering two things of like one, like biomotive when I learned that, like there was just a lot of, um, is very technical and like, here's how you proceed and, like here's the layers that you go through and like you have to like learn the words and go through them and just like I had to go through the motions like tens even hundreds of times with someone that had done it before I did it with Doug and uh, then um, Daniel Thorson and I you know did a bunch together and like uh, just like going through it again and again and again with someone that had done it before was familiar with it was really helpful and then um, I remember learning parts work and IFS like that was a bit simpler, like procedurally as to what to do, but I found that in practice, and, and this happens with other modalities um, or it has in the past where like, I would basically disassociate if I tried to do it myself. If someone was holding the container, then like I could concentrate and remember what I was saying, but then often there'd be this sort of disassociation thing. And eventually I sort of unwound that um, Daniel actually gave me a really good tip, which was like, enter jhana first, like enter the bliss states first, and then, and then do the thing. And then it turns out you just like, don't disassociate if you sort of cleaned the mind out that way. And there's a nice feedback loop there where like, you go deeper into the jhanas after you do these too. So it's just like, Mm. goes between them and they both deepen. But um, at least in the beginning, I was, it was like pretty common when learning those modalities that if I did it by myself, even with like, compared to biomotive I think parts work is like simpler not not completely simple but simpler um but like and I like knew how to do it procedurally but I would just disassociate by myself and I think having someone to hold the space was helpful in the beginning and then yeah there's I think those are the two main reasons at least in my experience that I've found a lot of help from having someone else hold the containers either either just learning how to do the thing or like there's something that I can't quite do myself because of the way my uh, psyche is like structured or something. It's like, uh, I can't scratch this itch myself and need support here. Yeah. I'm glad you brought in biomotive because that one, I mean, I actually, so I went to one of the, the workshops on it and I have helped friends, mostly friends, like, like go through some of those stages, but I actually have not tapped into it for a while because it did not click for me mm-hmm. um i have just like stuff from childhood of like you will not make me cry mm-hmm. and i didn't quite realize at the beginning of starting to work with biomotive how much that would get brought up mm-hmm. and it um yeah it super did not like all those internal defenses would come up if I thought that somebody was like trying to, mm. to push me in any way to cry. And it was just like, 
<laughs> unworkable. Yeah. So I think sometimes there's things that at a certain point on somebody's path are just not going to be accessible. Maybe they would be accessible in the future after some other thing got untangled. Um, but yeah. Also for biomotive, it's um, uh, like something like core transformation. It is designed to mostly like bring people into a state that feels good. Like they feel like they're starting with like an activated state and like starting to bring it into something that feels more and more good ideally. But a motive is starting from a state and then like it kind of amps up the feeling bad like the the, the challenge of intensity, it until yeah. you the intensity until you get to this um I don't know like touched in with the deep humanity that it is to feel worthless or something mm -hmm. like oh but, but it, like it needs to be held in that way or like if, if core transformation fails at some point when someone's self-facilitating it's probably going to just like fizzle there's gonna be like oh I got distracted I got like I felt dull I felt like what's going on if biomotive like fails at some point in the process someone might be pretty upset they might be like, I'm a piece of shit. I'm a worthless, worthless mm -hmm. piece of shit. It's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I feel worthless because <laughs> feeling worthless is just one of these states that humans can get into. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's tricky because I think uh, the way it's presented um, it seems somewhat simplified from what the model that I see like Doug and Ali doing of like, they talk about... Um, so it's like, yeah, at the first there's like narrative stories and then there's emotions, the, the four main emotions, and then there's interpersonal feelings, and then there's the core feelings like worthlessness. And then there's also this other layer, which often isn't for, to my recollection, like presented in the materials necessarily explicitly, but of like feeling beliefs, which are like, uh, like these, yeah, I think they relate to these, like, um, I forget how they talk about in coherence therapy, but like whatever these sort of like um, you know, like sanskaras from a Buddhist perspective, or like, you know, these deep, these deep patterns. Um, and it's tricky to, like, I don't think they present how to get to those and like, in the materials necessarily. And I, one of the things I had to work out was like, how to find those and speak them. And then like, if you can, basically, I think if you don't get to that level of the feeling beliefs, um, it's like, either what you're saying of, oh, you're just like cycling into this emotion that's intense, or it's like sort of um, a release, which is nice. I like use that mm. a lot. But then, but if you get to the feeling belief and you say that, then it's like, that's when it is really like, I think reconsolidating from a coherence perspective. Is it, would it, would a feeling belief, which I might map to like an emotional schema, uh, yes. be something like, I, I have to suffer to balance out. I I have to I have to punish myself so that if I don't punish myself, no, I won't get any good things or something. Or, yes. Or... Yes, it's like that. It's and it's definitely like the schemas. And I think it it it's a belief about self and world that is composed of the feelings that you mentioned up to that point. So it might involve worthlessness, right? Like I have to be worthless so God will love me or something. Could be a belief someone could pick up. Like right. it doesn't make any logical sense, but on an emotional level, like that could be a thing that you, like when you just say it, it's like what? But then like emotionally, that could be a very real thing for someone. And then if you can actually find that kind of a sentence, which is very tricky and often why it's helpful to have someone like Doug or Ali or whoever say it, like be like, I think you believe that you're worthless so that God can mm -hmm. love you. Like, oh shit, I never knew that, but that is it. Uh, if you find that, it, yeah. That's often that like re like kind of reconsolidation moment of like, yeah. oh my God, like, wait, this feel, this has felt deeply true, but also this is completely like absurd, but like, yes. it's also, oh my God, like you see, <laughs> you see, you feel both and then it, yeah. Yes. For me, one of the ones I found, so I found, so often with the, with the core feelings, it seems to me, I, I don't know that like, there's sort of like two or three that most people will be feeling like all the time. So for me, if I say, I feel sad and alone, like that sentence can make me cry. Just like, like, yeah, I feel it out. It's like, like, you know, here I am talking to a dear friend and I still feel sad and alone, like so on some level, right. It's like emotional furniture of just like in the room. Um, and often those ones seem to have like one of these feeling beliefs associated with it so like for me the one that i found that was just like 
was, um, or one of them was like, I, um, like, uh, I am so, something like I am alone and unlovable and no one will ever love me. Like I'm undeserving of love or something like that. And just like seeing that my system like really believed that on a deep level. And it's like, uh, anyway, and psychologically now that I mentioned, I was like, huh, this is why you do so much meta meditation and doing so much love. Like, hmm, 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 trying to find love you say, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. But like, I think that that's, um, yeah, a really important thing to, that I just wanted to say about that particular technique, because I, I think it it's like, uh, I don't know how to say this skillfully. Um, I know, I think at that level, it's, it really is a transformative technique if you can get to that level, but it, it's it, because it's it's like tricky to get there and yeah, benefits from having someone that really knows how that works and that sort of thing. I might wanna revisit some of that, like, because there's definitely times with, with clients where I'm like, oh man, this is, this, this feels like it could, it could go into a biomotive flavor, but I haven't yet, um, had this experience of how to work in how that works with the feeling beliefs in that context so that mm -hmm. might be really yeah that's that's I mean that's that technique is like one of my bread and butters at this point of mm -hmm. like I, I think I do that technique pretty much every day internally at, at some point and uh yeah it's some good stuff so yeah big fan of biomotive over here I think I don't know and I think I think Really, that's why I love this like flourishing of this sort of self therapy therapy scene of because there's so many different techniques and like different things are going to work for different people and for me like that and parts work probably have been two of the biggest ones and like uh, you know for a different person a different mix is going to be really helpful and like if one doesn't work like that's that's fine just try a different one so yeah yeah I mean that's it's 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 a cool time to be experimenting and, and learning with these these modalities it's almost like it's like the mixed martial arts but like the mixed <laughs> compassionate arts or something <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i remember hermes said that a while ago i think on, on twitter it's like yeah mixed martial arts good metaphor for that yeah. um, well we've covered a bunch of territory is there anything that you'd like to say more about or talk more about in a conversation hmm. i mean there's there's this last part of what we were talking about, the self-therapy, the sort of communities of people who are exploring these techniques, like even going back to some of the difference between psychedelic guides who are therapists in a clinical setting versus in a kind of community setting, it's sort of like, what is the community setting that we're there, there's something that this might be more of a topic for a whole nother conversation in the future. But I even just want to kind of bookmark that there is something that feels really important for me about like, what is the nature of these community settings as they currently exist? And what might we imagine or even want to bring into be, to, to being that can make those even more like robust and res resilient? Because like one of the main things that has, when I think of, I've thought about going back to school, getting a therapy license, and I'm just like, there is a big wall that says you cannot be in community with the people that you are, that are your clients for therapy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, well, I and then, you know, I understand why. And there's many, many good reasons for that, but also like, yeah, it's a big topic. Mm -hmm. So, mm. yeah, that makes sense. I think as you say that I'm reminded of like, you know, there's a big emphasis on, um, you know, I was just talking with Vivid Void yesterday about uh, like his, one of the things he and I talked about was like his politics and sort of talking about like localism. And I think there's an emphasis on um, in some circles of like, oh, we lost all of these things that like older communities used to have of like various community structures of like, oh, like let's build a house together, for example, or like, oh, if you need child care, we'll give you that. Or, oh, like this person knows about medical care or something. And there's sort of like community things. And as you were speaking to that, I was imagining something similar with like, you know, which I think happens on Twitter in our circles and so on to some extent, but um, I think it's not nearly sufficiently robust for like the planet at large yet, but of something like that of like, 
you know, you know, for example, how, you know, we were talking about biomotive just now, I've never taken their formal training. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I'm not like certified in that, but like to me internally, the way I think of it, it's like, you know, I've done a bunch of biomotive. I have thoughts about it. I think I can explain it well to someone I could facilitate. I have facilitated many people with it. And it's like, I'm not formally trained. I'm not a therapist, but like, there's a kind of like, you know, if, 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 um, actually there was someone I was staying with on my, uh, pilgrimage that was going through a difficult thing emotionally. And they were having trouble, like expressing what they were feeling and like processing. And I was like, Hey, if you want, I could lead a biomotive session for you. And it's like, no, I'm not a therapist. No, I'm not even officially licensed in this modality, but like, yeah, that was able to help someone. And I like, I like that kind of thing spreading. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's like, I don't know even what metaphors to use the things you talk about, you know, people helping each other with childcare, people helping each other build the house. It's like, what's the equivalent of, well, first of all, you know, people do also have all these very pragmatic, tangible needs like that. Like those needs haven't gone away. Mm -hmm. And there's also still a lot of, you know, a lot of people's distress is related to not having enough slack in other dimensions. But I have, I have, you know, what's the equivalent of people surrounding one person who's just gone through, you know, one thing is like if someone's just had given birth, like there is this, ideally you'd have community support or family support to come in and help them with that. There's also like if someone has just uh, experienced a grief, a loss, a bereavement, you know, there's this kind of can can people come around that what's the equivalent of a barn raising for emotional and mental health you know mm -hmm. what's the what's the equivalent of, <laughs> of some of these these different things yeah i think some of it probably is just literacy of like having more people that are familiar with these techniques and like uh you know i mean as, as you were saying earlier like part of the reason you created your wiki is like for someone that you cared about and that you wanted to have know about these things. And like, you, I mean, you didn't have that wiki when you were, you know, younger. So um, that, I mean, and that's part of why I see what you're doing as such a service is like, it's really helpful to people and uh, it's helped me, it's helped other people I know. And it's like just out there on the internet for free. It's great. Uh, and more and more of that kind of thing. I think these kinds of conversations help people. Um, so I don't know what the whole answer is, but you are definitely doing it, my friend, and I appreciate that quite a bit. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? I think that's most of it. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like trying to see if we have that goal crafting mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but no, we don't have the landing page up yet. I don't think, but, but there'll be one watch, in September. Yes, there will be one in September on the weekend of the weekend of the 24th and 25th. Hmm. So. Great. Yeah. Yeah attended one of those before and they're really helpful. So if someone's interested in that, definitely recommend it. And thank you so much for joining me, friend. I really appreciated this conversation. Yeah, so glad to be part of it and love to talking to you on this uh, podcast format. Mm.